Hello, everybody. We've reached 9 a.m. Pacific, 12 noon Eastern. And if you look at timeanddate.com, you'll find your own time and your own time zone there as well. Before we begin this next session, Change as for Learning in the Age of Artificial Intelligence, ePortfolio Practices for Mitigating Change, we thought it would be a good time to take a moment and thank this year's sponsors. Pebble Pad and Dream. So, Tracy, do you have any specifics that you'd like to say right now? Or is it really we appreciate the fact that they are so supportive and have enabled us to have an annual conference once again? Yeah, just uh, exactly that, Kevin. I'm really happy to partner with both um, Pebble Pad and Dream, and they'll be our sponsors for all our ABLE events over the coming year. And so really grateful for, for their support and looking forward to learning a little bit more about um, both Pebble Pad and Dream as the conference goes on. So thanks to them. Fantastic. So before we begin the session, uh, just a few housekeeping uh, details for everyone who's in the room. This session is being recorded. So if you do not want your image or likeness to be captured, then feel free to turn off your camera. We know other people um, choose not to turn it on for a variety of reasons, just like our students. Um, we're also um, enabling the Zoom captions. They're the automated transcripts. So if you would like to use those captions, um, just go down to the toolbar at the bottom of the Zoom window, and you'll either see a closed caption button or it'll be hidden in the button that says more with the three dots. And then you'll just use the show subtitle option on the menu that pops up. Next, we encourage questions and comments in the chat. These sessions are all highly interactive. Um, so we ask you to pose your questions using the chat function. I will um, keep an eagle eye on it as Tracy does her presentation, but um, we hope that uh, you'll ask those questions and we'll squeeze them in as appropriate when the content dictates. Um, and then last but not least, I'd like to take a moment to introduce um, Tracy Penny Light, who, as mentioned in the last session, is the president of ABLE and has also taken on uh, leadership roles around uh, the continent. And so um, we're excited to have her back on the mainland of North America. And uh, we're excited to hear, Tracy, what you have to say related to change as for learning in the age of AI. So please take it away. Thanks so much, Kevin. Well, thanks so much to all of you for being here at uh, this session today. I'm really excited to think about this topic with you. and. It's a topic that I've been thinking about, not specifically in terms of AI, but in terms of change and the role that ePortfolios can play over the last several years. And a catalyst for this thinking, you know, that's sort of been percolating in my mind as I've worked with a variety of colleagues and campuses to implement ePortfolios is the ways that universities and colleges, so higher education more broadly, is not particularly adept at managing change. And so that's been an observation over the last 20 years or so of the work that I've been doing. And it wasn't until last fall when I was asked um, to give a keynote at the South Atlantic Modern Language Association meeting, or SAMLA, on the topic of change that they got me thinking about this. So um, I'll give you a little bit more context in a minute. Before we move any further, I just want to give you an opportunity to take a moment to breathe. I always like to just start our my sessions with this opportunity. And so I'm going to encourage you wherever you are to find a comfortable seat. Feel free to look off screen if that feels um, more comfortable for you. And I would encourage you to do that throughout today's session because it's not great for us to look at a screen for hours on end, which we tend to do in online conferences. I'm going to get you to think about where you're sitting, or you could stand up as well, and just sort of draw your shoulder blades onto your back. So widen your collarbones and draw them down. You should feel that that creates a little bit of space between your vertebrae. You could just have your hands in your lap or wherever they're comfortable, your feet on the floor. And you could either close your eyes if that's comfortable for you, or just soften your gaze 
And just begin to notice your breath moving in and out of the body. You don't really have to do anything at all, but notice. And then you're noticing you might note that the belly is expanding a little bit. Maybe your chest is rising as you inhale. You might notice also that as you exhale, especially if you can lengthen that exhale a little bit, you get a sense of a grounding sensation. Just take a couple more inhales and exhales, just at whatever rhythm feels right for you. And feel free to adjust in any way that you need to. And let's just all take a big inhale and exhale together. So just let everything go and we'll take a big inhale. And a nice slow exhale. I encourage you to come back to your breath throughout today's session and just notice what happens as um, we talk about change. Maybe maybe you'll get excited like I do. Uh, maybe um, you'll you'll feel. I uh, hopefully there's a fine line between excitement and anxiety. So hopefully I'm not going to take you into the anxiety zone. But um, if you do feel that happening, just give yourself an opportunity to to take a few deep breaths and move around as much as you need to in today's session um, it will be interactive and not just me talking at you for the next um, while so uh, as kevin noted that i do wear many different hats and um, one is currently i'm the dean of the faculty of arts and sciences at capilano university in in north vancouver canada um, I've been there since February, so it's a new role for me, but I've been in leadership roles throughout my career and as I mentioned earlier have been thinking a lot um, over the last um, couple of decades about the notion of change. And um, I'm also a registered yoga teacher, so that's hence the, the breathing and a mindfulness coach. So I always like to bring that perspective into the work that I do and then um, as I, Kevin mentioned, I'm also um, president and chair of the board at ABLE. And I think all of those roles really are kind of wrapped up in this um, identity for me uh, of um, being a reflective practitioner, a change manager, and, um, and, and a transformation facilitator. And that looks a little bit different in the different contexts, you know, but I'm always hoping that those are qualities that surround any of the work that I do. And because I do that kind of work, I have been really mindful and in, in, in terms of thinking about change throughout the course of my career. Here are a couple of definitions for you. Um, you know, the first is a verb changed or changing. The, the idea here is to make um, different uh, something, to make something a little bit different in a particular way. Um, we could also use change as a noun, where it really means this notion of transformation. And in today's um, session, I'm hoping that we're going to think about both of, of those um, definitions of change and how we might leverage our work in ePortfolios to help um, mitigate some of the challenges that I think sometimes um, come at us in higher education. And so um, I want to start with a couple of, um, well, three stories of change um, from my own career in consulting. And the first is around leadership change. So um, I've worked with lots of different campuses to implement portfolios, including campuses that I've been on myself. And one thing that is um, not uncommon, maybe this is um, surprising to you, it's, it's not that surprising to me because there is um, there tends to be a bit of leadership churn um, in higher education. So it's not uncommon to have a leader in a, in a position for three to five years, and then they kind of move on to, to the next thing. Um, so when implementing ePortfolios, it's not uncommon for leadership to change. And sometimes that's the leader who has been the driving force behind a, an initiative. And so this can cause a lot of disruption and sometimes crisis on campuses. So 
thinking about change and that leadership uh, turnover is I think really important for us as we're, we're planning for our e-portfolio implementation. I'm a historian as well as uh, all the other things that I told you about. And so context for me is really important. And um, when we, I think about um, context change, I think we've all experienced this and um, the most kind of prescient example of this, I think in the recent past has been the, the global pandemic. So COVID-19, right? We all experienced a significant context change. We got locked down, we had to rapidly um, switch to teaching um, and learning in different modal modalities. At the time uh, that COVID-19 hit, I was um, leading um, teaching and learning initiatives at uh, um, an uh, offshore private medical school. And so this was a significant um, change for us to manage because teaching in a clinical setting is difficult to do online. And so we had to really rapidly think about how do we, how do we manage that disruption? And so um, I spent a lot of time over kind of a year and a half period really supporting my colleagues in thinking about how to leverage online technologies to foster not only the, the standard medical curricula, you know, the, the, the science and, um, and, and things that, that students need to understand, but also how, how to not only teach and learn clinical content, but also how to assess that. And so that was, that was a huge disruption in terms of um, the work that we were doing in that context change. And I think probably this happened for many of you as well. When things started to open up, when we started to return, we were having the conversations around what did we wanna keep from that learning that was part of that contextual shift to, to online learning. And in some cases, we decided to maintain the online um, work that we were doing in service of deeper student learning at medical school and in veterinary medicine. So, um, so sometimes change leads to, um, well, I think it can always lead to, lead to positive outcomes. I always think of it as an opportunity, but um, I know sometimes it's like, oh my gosh, what's happening right now? And it, it can't, it sometimes doesn't feel that way. And then in terms of teaching change, I've seen a lot of changes over my career in terms of, of teaching approaches from the advent of new technologies. So I was a faculty member when we first started to use learning management systems. And so um, helping colleagues to really think through how to effectively leverage the LMS in service of student learning um, to new methods. So also um, have experienced, you know, thinking about um, how we could design learning objects to foster deep learning. So um, interactive modules that would enable students to dive deep into content, um, leveraging new technologies, um, thinking about um, new methods like studio physics and, and how to support faculty members in the sciences to really take on that new approach. And um, right now we're thinking about AI in the context of teaching change, right? So what, is that going to mean for us in terms of our, our work moving forward? And I think that there's you know, some worry there about how AI might impact um, student learning negatively. And certainly in our work with ePortfolios, we're thinking about how do we really leverage portfolio practices to um, mitigate some of the potential challenges that AI might pose um, to us. And I think there are some great opportunities for this. So I want to get us started sharing together and, and get you just to do some initial brainstorming around um, changes or disruptions or crises that you've experienced either in your e-portfolio efforts on your campus or in other aspects of your work. So there is a Jamboard available and I'm going to just encourage you to post your ideas to the Jamboard. So Kevin, I think is gonna put the link I to put, the Jamboard. I already put the, the link. Oh, you put it in, awesome. Thanks, Candace. So you can go ahead and um, just think about changes or disruptions that you've experienced either in your portfolio efforts or in other aspects of your work. It doesn't have to be one of the changes that I've mentioned. It could be something totally different. Uh, social political changes. Um, at the state level in the United States, which are encroaching on how we do the hard work of higher education. Yes, yes, use of chat bots to create student e-portfolio content. 
going from a requirement for graduation to an optional tool and a loss of engagement. I'm, I'm assuming you're, you're talking about e-portfolios there. So that's, that's a significant change. I've also heard things like we embedded the e-portfolio into our general education and then general education um, and the approach being used on our campus completely changed. And so what did that mean in terms of how um, to manage that? Changes in collaboration about portfolios, who owns the initiative. Institutional student learning outcomes have been updated this year, which was positive change. Okay, great. We're going to think about um, positive changes as well. Um, more surface learning as students feel overwhelmed. Yeah, I think the current context, we're feeling that on our campus too. Um, it's very expensive for students to live in um, Vancouver, the Vancouver area. We have a lot of international students, and so um, lots of students, lots of our students, I think, everywhere are working more hours in order to support their education. So, how do we um, make sure that we're able to support them? And one of the things I was speaking about um, with some of my colleagues the other day was, you know, sort of what kind of training they feel that they need. And um, we talked, we were talking about things like trauma informed. Um, practices in, in education to help them feel like they can be supportive of their students who are experiencing all kinds of different changes. Um, so that can have an impact on, on what we do. Um, and then um, I see one here, initial excitement changing into frustration because the process of approvals and such is not moving fast enough. Yeah. Um, and then I see one being circled changes in student behavior, expectations, and attitudes toward learning. You know, we might kind of think about how that contextual change of the pandemic has impacted how our students are understanding um, their place in the academy. And, um, and you know, in turn, that, that causes us to have to think about what's our place and, and how are we managing that. And these are all really um, great ideas. And, um, Leadership changes, faculty voted narrowly to adopt portfolios. Mm, interesting. So not necessarily widespread support among faculty, but um, enough that it got passed. And now what? Um, how do we how do we support that? Um, legislative out overreach in the curriculum. Yeah. Changes in student motivation to do assignments. Yeah, so lots, lots of changes, some support from leadership to give faculty time release to adopt use of e-portfolios could be a positive. Um, working remotely has changed my work life. Social interaction is 100% remote and only professional. Ah, so that's a significant change um, for sure in terms of, of managing. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen again. Thank you so much for sharing. These are uh, fantastic ideas. See if I can get this back. Got to get back onto the <laughs> the other screen. Thank you for your patience. Okay. All right. So we've had our initial brainstorm. Well, why are we even talking about this? Why why am I bringing this um, to to your attention? Um, as I've said, I've been thinking about this notion of change and change management in the context of the e-portfolio work that I've done over the last number of years. It's always been there percolating and I've made some observations on different campuses that I've been at about the ways that we uh, manage change more often than not, not well on, on campuses. I think one of the things that happens in higher education is we're very, um, it can be very slow to foster change. So um, you know, the analogy of, of having to move the tight, turn the Titanic, right? It's a very, very slow thing because there are systems and processes that sort of guide um, the work of universities and colleges that make it difficult sometimes to, to make change, you know, to the point that somebody made quickly on our campuses. And I've also been um, really informed by some of these different uh, books on uh, different aspects of leadership, and in particular, the work by Erica James and Lynn Perry Wooten, um, this book, The Prepared Leader, which I highly recommend, where they talk about this notion of preparedness and the need for leaders to really be thinking ahead about the kinds of crises. And I think in, in our context, we might just think about change or disruption, you know, sort of things that happen perhaps that we weren't intent, you know, we weren't planning for 
um, on our campuses and, and their, um, their suggestions, I think, can be really, really useful. And then I'll also plug um, all of the other books there on the screen as well as, as, as great, um, I think, different, uh, different takes on this notion of leadership and what we, what we can do. And I think sometimes, at least I didn't think of myself this way. I didn't, yes, I was managing strategic innovation projects early on in my career and ePortfolios was one of those projects, but I didn't really think of myself as a leader. I guess I thought of myself more as a facilitator or guide, but it is a leadership role. If all of you are playing a leadership role, regardless of your position on your campus, whether you're a faculty member, whether you're in um, student affairs, whether you're helping to um, move the initiative forward as as the capital L leader or whether you're there as part of the team. I mean, we all have a leadership role to play. And I think the ways that ePortfolio practices and pedagogies um, are, are borne out can help us to play that leadership role a little bit better. So the goals for today, really, I have a few um, outcomes that I'm hoping we're going to achieve. And the first is to, to identify some of the disruptions that prevent change or transformation in higher education. So um, what are some of the things that, that we're pushing against that we need to sort of mitigate in some way or another? Um, I want to give us an opportunity to discuss some of those strategies um, that we can use to prepare for change. We'll reflect on ePortfolio practices that enable transformative change. So these are positive changes, things that we can leverage in service of the work that we're trying to achieve. And then um, have a little bit of time at the end so that you can start planning for ways that you could mitigate um, change to enable transformation on your individual campus. So I'm going to give you a spoiler alert and tell you <laughs> right now what the key takeaways are for today's session. Um, really, I think all of our initiatives are going to experience some kind of disruption. You know, we might have a flood on our campus. Um, we might have a leadership change. Gen Ed might uh, go in a different direction. We might have a change in tool or technology that the university has adopted or college has adopted to, to foster our ePortfolio work. So planning is really essential. Um, we need to do that planning in order um, to enable us to mitigate those changes. And so it, this is, can be a really hard thing to do because most of us, as you're gonna see in a minute, aren't hardwired to think that way, right? We kind of we've got a plan, even if we have really clear outcomes and, and maybe we're really excellent project managers and have a super duper Gantt chart and we've mapped it all out. It's not easy to, um, to plan for a disruption. And yet what Perry, um, Wooten and um, James suggest is that it is inevitable, right? So the COVID-19 pandemic was something that caught many of us off guard. And we know there's going to be another something. And so really getting into this process of leveraging um, this kind of thinking is gonna serve us in the long run. Change can be transformative. It can be really hard. And it also can really transform the systems and structures in which we're working. And so what that looks like on your campus and in your culture is gonna be probably different than in other places, but um, how are we planning for that transformative change in a way that suits our campus culture? And as I mentioned before, ePortfolio practices can really enable knowledge management. And I use that, those words very um, specifically. One thing I think I've observed at you know, universities, all of the ones that I've worked at, is that we don't do a great job of, knowledging, of, of managing knowledge. So it's really common to reinvent the wheel on a campus. So some of you may be in a situation where there was an ePortfolio initiative a while ago, it died for whatever reason, and now you're trying it again. Do you have the historical documents, the archive of what happened previously guiding you moving forward? I suspect for most of us, the answer to that question is no, we don't. We don't do a great job of this, but here's where I think ePortfolios can help. And so we're gonna talk about sort of four practices in ePortfolio pedagogy that I think can be helpful here. So employing mindfulness and reflection, using um, the notion of documenting what it is that we're doing as well as storytelling, telling the story of, of the initiative and making sure that everybody knows about it. So why should we focus on change and transformation? Well, this is uh, James and Wooten speaking, and I, I'm changing their word crisis because um, it, it's not always a, a, a capital C crisis on our campus, but I think changes happen all the time. So they're not just one-offs. 
They happen time and time again. And just as one change starts to resolve, another is taking shape. Unfortunately, human beings are not ideally equipped to deal with them. We do not ordinarily plan for the atypical, the anomalous, the irregular, or the exceptional on a day-to-day -day basis. We're hardwired to neglect the possibility of a change. And I'm already observing that in the call, con, context that I'm working, where despite the fact that we've just kind of come out of this pandemic context, we're sort of moving forward, which I think makes sense. We, we all want to, you know, sort of return to normal. And yet that's probably the worst thing that we could do. We really need to make sure that we're planning ahead for that next um, that next crisis, that next big change that's going to come our way. And so, thinking about your e-portfolio initiative, where are there opportunities to to kind of keep that in mind? So, two more influences that I wanted to share with you in terms of the thinking today. The first is the diffusion of innovation curve. Most of you probably have seen this um, this notion, and, and and I'm sure experienced it with your e-portfolio initiatives. You, you're going to have some um, innovators and early adopters. These are the people who are like, oh yeah, I'm really keen to try that and I'm not afraid of change. Um, but then most of our colleagues are, are kind of more toward the middle or end of the curve, right? So, so thinking about how are you rolling out your initiative to deal with um, where you're going to be at in those different moments in the curve and what do you need to be doing um, either the same or differently depending on the stakeholder groups that you're working with. And the other influence is this arc of possibilities. And this comes from my colleague and teacher, um, Raquel Bueno, who's a, a, a yoga therapist. And in yoga, we talk about um, this arc. And it's the idea that, and you know, sometimes we talk about it in terms of designing a sequence. If anybody of you, any of you are yoga practitioners, you'll you'll kind of have a know, have an understanding of what I mean. Often when you take a, a yoga class or I would say any kind of fitness class, generally speaking, you gotta have the warm up, right? That's the beginning part. You're, you're building up to some kind of peak pose or you know the most intense exercise. Maybe it's a, um, an abs class. And so you're kind of warming everything up so that you can really focus on that core work in the middle and then you're kind of cooling down and then the cool down is the ending part. If you notice that the diffusion of innovation curve is looks the same as this curve it's like a wave right so the world operates in waves and if you think about change and e-portfolio initiatives on your campus it's this idea of waves so right now we're beginning a wave where maybe we're kind of almost to the the beginning of the dotted line with artificial intelligence and thinking about what does that look like for e-portfolios and so the beginning part is all about how are we setting ourselves up to manage that particular change? The middle part is sort of where we're doing the work. Like this is where it's going on. And there might also be little waves, you know, even in each of these parts. So it's not just one overarching wave, but it's, it's cyclical or iterative. And then the ending part is, I think for me, what I really am drawn to, that's the residual effect. Where do we want our learners to be as a result of having this experience with us? So if you think about your ePortfolio initiative, what do you want to leave them with? I think that it's really powerful when students document their learning and showcase their learning to us in a way that is meaningful for them. And my hope always is that they're not doing that and moving on and forgetting that they did it. So that means that we have to, at the ending part, begin again, right? We need to start thinking about how are we engaging them at a different point than where they started. So imagine you've got students in a first year seminar, you want to get them excited, they're learning about being a learner at college and university, they're thinking about how they can document the knowledge, skills, and abilities in terms of the context of that first year seminar, they have their portfolio that they submit toward the end of the term. That's really exciting. Maybe there's a showcase. And then the course ends. And maybe they never deal with their portfolio again. And, and I hear that a lot in portfolio initiatives. You know, there's a, there's a bookend kind of an approach. 
But we wanna make sure that we're not neglecting that ending part. How are we enabling them to continue their thinking about e-portfolio practice? Really that, that notion of making connections between and among their various learning experiences so that they'll take that with them and use it again and again. And I think that's where the transformation part comes in. So if we think about the idea of, of, of change or um, change management or crisis management, James and Wooten say there are four phases, or sorry, five phases of, of this. We have early warning and signal detection. So as you're rolling through your um, initiative, where are there potential signs that something might go awry? So I, I saw on one of the post-it notes, you know, um, faculty buy-in, maybe, you know, only a certain percentage of faculty actually were in favor of, of e-portfolios. Okay, that's an early warning sign. <laughs> you're gonna have some folks who are not in that innovator early adopter phase of the innovation curve, and you're gonna need to help them to understand why they're wanting to take this up at, at a certain point. There's a preparation and prevention. So once you know, okay, there's, there's a signal there that this, there might be a problem. How are we pre preparing for um, and preventing any kind of problems from arising? When and if a problem arises, how are we containing any damage that might cause? I can remember um, an early warning sign for, for one of the initiatives that I was part of early on. We were um, designing e-portfolios for accounting. And the idea for um, the e-portfolio initiative was to enable accounting students to surface the um, sort of professional skills that employers were telling uh, us that the students weren't very good at. So we were like, okay, we're going to use the portfolio to help them understand how to make visible their professional skills so that employers could see that and feel really good about hiring them, knowing that they were going to be good communicators, great team players, um, awesome collaborators. Yeah, really excited. We planned it all out. We went to the first meeting with the accounting faculty. So this was an, a, one of the accounting faculty members who was the lead on the project and myself as the, the kind of managing the, the innovation project. We're so excited to tell them about this new project, right? And we're going to have students reflect on their learning to showcase their professional skills. And the look on people's faces was... Um, well, let's just say it was very visible. You know, people made faces, they, you know, crinkled up their noses, they started turning to each other and talking about like, what are they getting at? And we realized, ruh -ruh, this is not going the way we want it to. And so we we had the conversation with them, like, what, to, can you share a little bit about what what's not landing well with you? And it was that idea of reflection. Accountants do not reflect, we were told. That is not something that we do in our profession. That's something that nurses do. And I'll never forget that moment. So that was an early warning that we needed to rethink um, the language that we were reusing as we were rolling out this particular initiative. And so we were able to contain that, that damage of that first meeting where it could have gone totally sideways if we hadn't paid attention to the fact that the language we were using um, didn't land at all with um, the professionals that we were working with. It was also a great signal that if it wasn't landing with the accounting professors, it probably wasn't gonna land with the accounting students either. So we had to really think about how, how we were framing this notion of reflecting on learning, folio thinking for students. That enabled us to really recover from that and plan forward. And we took that learning and reflection into our work with other stakeholders on the campus. So we also worked with engineers, definitely don't use the word reflection very often, but they do have design rationale documents. And so we learned to go and have conversations with the stakeholders about what was meaningful for them in the context of their profession or their discipline. And when we learned about what was important to them, we framed the portfolio initiative around the ways that would make sense and enable them to make meaning of that process in a way that suited them. And that aligns with the ePortfolio implementation framework that we talk about in our book, Documenting Learning with ePortfolios, because when you go through this um, implementation framework and you think about how you're designing your outcomes, you're identifying the learners and stakeholders, you're thinking about the learning activities that you're designing, the ways that you'll assess learning, 
um, the different tools and technologies you might use, and then how you're going to evaluate. It's the same kind of cycle or process, right? So we can, I think, bring these things together in a really meaningful way. James and Mouton also talk about nine skills of crisis management. And um, I see these as very much aligned with both um, the implementation framework and this notion of um, an arc of possibilities, right? So we're having to make sense of, um, and I would say we don't want to employ these skills only in a crisis. These should be skills that we're leveraging all the time in service of our portfolio initiatives. So we're making sense of what it is we're trying to do in the cultural context in which we're working. So each institution has its own, what, what my uh, mentor and colleague calls special sauce, right? Um, our campuses have a feel and a flavor to them that is unique and they're designed that way. So we have to make sense of how ePortfolios fit within that context. We need to take perspective of our colleagues, those various stakeholders that we're working with or will be working with to ensure that we're understanding where they're coming from. We need to be able to, as leaders, figure out where to best um, influence the trajectory that we wanna be on so that when crisis or change happens, we have, um, we're, we're able to influence from a place of trust, from a place where everyone understands where we're coming from and sees how we can be helpful in that process. That will enable us to be agile within our organizations. So um, having that, that conversation with the engineers and the accountants might not be the way to go on your campus. Maybe there are different conversations that you wanna have, and that will depend on the kind of initiatives that you're trying to roll out. But, you want to be able to be agile when change happens. We need to leverage our creativity. So um, how can we do things in a new and different way and make that palatable to our various stakeholders on our campuses? We want to communicate that effectively. This is, um, I think, one of the most challenging things to do because um, when we're in it, we know what we mean and we understand what we mean when we say things. But for those who are outside of that space communicating in a way that um, is understandable to them can be challenging. And so that might be using language that's very specific to your campus context. It might be using different words, but in a really transparent word or um, a transparent way across the different stakeholder groups that you're working with. We also need to be willing to take some risks. So um, when things aren't going well, how can you shift um, or, or do something in a different way? When the pandemic hit um, and we were thinking about how to engage students in clinical learning in a medical context, the initial um, perspective on that was that it's impossible, it can't be done. And so it was really important to find those early adopters, those innovators who were willing to take a risk and try something different so that we had good examples of how this could work for others. So I'm thinking of a couple of colleagues specifically in veterinary medicine who used balloons and um, you know, household items, pets, whatever it might be, so that the students could have some hands-on clinical experience, but in the context in which they were um, quarantined. So that was really exciting. We also want to promote resilience. We know when uh, change happens, it can be really stressful for everyone, including for the leaders themselves. And so how do we um, look after ourselves in this whole process? And, and I would say these skills, as I mentioned, are important in our initiatives, generally speaking, as well as um, when there's a change at hand. And then individual and systemic learning, like how are we documenting the learning that's coming out of those changes, those disruptions, so that we can continue moving forward, but not reinvent the wheel and not make the same mistakes over again a year from now, five years from now, whatever it might be. And I think that's where we, we struggle in higher education. So I wanna send you back to the Jamboard to do a little reflection for yourself around the skills that you have that you think will enable you to mitigate change on your campus. You could um, think about AI in particular as a contextual change that's happening and how that might influence your ePortfolio initiative, 
or you could think of another change that might be happening on your campus. We talked before about leadership changes, funding changes. There's there's lots of things that that could um, that could come about that might threaten your initiative. So on the Jamboard, I've put the, the nine skills on there for you. So it's the same length um, as to the previous Jamboard, it's just on board two. Um, so take a moment to think about the nine skills for crisis management. What have you done? What skills do you have um, at your ready to manage change? What other, and what learning opportunities do you need um, in order to help you build those skills? moving forward. So we'll take about five more minutes and I'll let you go ahead and play on the Jamboard. There are lots of great ideas coming up again in the chat, or sorry, in the on the Jamboard. Um, so I'll just read some of them out for those of you um, on the recording. So change doesn't land for some faculty until it lands in the learning outcomes box. How to get faculty to think about learning outcomes as something in need of constant review adaptation. Yes, yes, yes. That can be hard. Um, I think even for myself, you know, we get teaching courses and they tend to be our courses and um, or things that we're, we're known for teaching and we, we have a really great um, design and we set them up. And I remember teaching one of uh, you know my courses where e-portfolios were a big part of them, and uh, realizing you know after several iterations that um, I had the students really actively reflecting on their learning throughout the course, but that actually wasn't one of the learning outcomes, and it was just sort of this aha moment of like why do I not have a learning outcome that is framed around reflection and that being a skill that I wanted students to develop so it can be hard for us sometimes to to kind of see the forest for the trees when we're in it but uh, yeah rethinking the outcomes is really important. Um, sense making linking initiatives to larger institutional goals and or challenges. Yes, 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 yes. Um, and I would add to that also, um, you know, and I think this is probably what you're meaning, you know, what's your institutional strategic vision or plan? And how does your initiative fit into that so that it's it's really aligned and integrated into the kinds of things that your institution is doing otherwise perspective taking. Um, reframing conversations to move away from only academic to co-curricular learning so that portfolios are not seen as an extra burden for faculty, absolutely. And in a perfect world, don't we want the students to be integrating the learning that's happening across those different contexts? Um, skills we learned in developing our affordable learning OER initiatives will help us to launch our portfolio pilot, I hope, I hope so too. I think that um, probably you can leverage those skills very well um, from those other institutional projects that you've been engaged in. Being very intentional about communicating and also being sensitive to not being top down. Absolutely. And that's, that's what I meant when we were having those conversations with the different stakeholders on our campus about what was meaningful for them rather than rolling in and saying, hey, don't you want to do e-portfolio work? It was more about how do we surface um, what's really important in this particular disciplinary or professional context so that we can find ways to kind of weave in conversation about the portfolio as a, an advantage of something they could do that would deepen um, what they were already working toward. Um, the organization is not agile and not within my control. How do I help people and the system be patient and more open? Mm, that's a great question. And um, I, you know, I'm, I'm curious what other people think about that one. But I, I my first instinct is to say, um, spend some time learning about where and when the organization is not agile. What are those kind of pinch points and where might there be opportunities to sort of leverage the portfolio um, into um, service of opening up some of those points might be um, a particular uh, strategy that you use there. Um, I wanna just make it so that I'm not just talking at you the whole time. So I do wanna give um, anyone else an, an opportunity to unmute and share if you have questions or comments so far. Okay, I'm gonna um, take you through the next few slides that are really about 
leveraging the e-portfolio practices themselves in service of um, change management. And so a couple of framing questions, what practices can we enable in our current context to manage change and transform learning? So practices here, I'm thinking specifically about e-portfolio practices that, um, that can help you know, with not only the e-portfolio initiative, but um, change management um, more broadly. And, um, and how can we leverage the e-portfolio practices to support transformative learning? So I actually see e-portfolio practices as doing just that. They, they are meant to foster transformation in higher education, specifically in terms of um, learners' understanding of themselves and their place in the world. Um, and if you think about folio thinking, that the culture of folio thinking really is is meant to provide really structured opportunities for learners to create not only their portfolios but to reflect and connect um, those learning experiences from those different spaces in which they're learning and i think that one of the opportunities here as someone had pointed out in the jamboard is that it's not not necessarily just about academic learning but opening up space for them to connect learning between and among contexts and so even before we had a, a co-curricular initiative on um, one of the campuses I was at, I asked students like, where else are you applying some of these skills or abilities? Where else are you learning things? You know, feel free to bring that into your portfolio. And students were a little bit perplexed by that because they were like, but am I not supposed to just talk about what we're doing in this course? And I said, yes, of course. And I'm, I'm curious, I wanna know more about you and I wanna know more about how this is, is helpful for you in terms of your learning or, or where you're learning in other places that might um, you know, be helpful in terms of our thinking. And once students got used to doing that, it was really powerful to see how they were making connections um, far beyond my individual course and into their, their learning more broadly. These are some of the examples of portfolio screenshots that um, demonstrate the different ways that students employ folio thinking. So um, in lots of different contexts, I'm not going to go through them because um, you probably have seen lots of portfolio examples, although I'm happy to share these um, after and, and we'll make the slides available. But the idea here is that the portfolios don't have to look the same and don't have to be structured similarly, but they do need to um, sort of leverage that notion of folio thinking and get the students to make connections um, between and among their learning experiences, whatever that means on your campus. Another element of portfolio practice that I think is really important is this notion of mindfulness. And you'll see it in relation to those nine skills um, for leaders to sort of prepared leaders that um, that they talk about and and this this notion of cultivating awareness being consciously present so how do you breathe at the beginning of today's session i hope you're still breathing um but it's important to to leverage that kind of approach into our day-to-day -day work with portfolios right and when i think about be consciously present i it makes me think of where are you giving yourself within your initiative time and space to notice are there early um, warnings or signals that you need to pay attention to. If we're just in the on the hamster wheel of trying to get an initiative going, it's easy to miss those things. And so how can you use these kinds of practices to really pay attention to what's happening, you know, by just undertaking one thing at a time? No easy feat on, on our campuses. Usually most of us are, are, are playing different roles and, and working on different projects all at once, but um, trying to keep you know, things on track in, in, a, in a kind of coherent way, taking our time. And I think for me, this one of the, the most important ones is adopting an inquiry stance. So even if you're not doing e-portfolio research per se, really being curious about what's happening as you do implement portfolios. And, and I think this is a, an important one when we think about artificial intelligence. What an opportunity to be curious about, hmm, I wonder how that will inform e-portfolio practice. What could we do with um, ChatGPT in order to enable students to make connections more deeply between and among their learning experiences? I don't know, but there's a, a good opportunity there, I think, to, to be curious. Um, reflection, you know, I think um, this is, um, I'm sure not new to any of you, but 
Um, I love this definition from Carol Rogers here, this notion that reflection is a meaning making process. You know, the idea that we're moving a learner from one experience to another to enable them to deepen their understanding of not only what they know, but who they are. Um, and that helps us, I think, in terms of our societal goals of, of making change and, and um, creating um, just um, societies and equitable um, experiences for everyone. It's a systematic and disciplined way of thinking. So it's not just something that you know, we do. And I think we wanna be careful as we work with students in particular, but I would say this is true for all of us. Reflection is not, not just about what I did, but how did what I've done how does what I've done sort of inform where I'm going to go next, right? And so it's a it's a systematic kind of approach. It's best when it happens in collaboration with others, right? We want to make sure that we're having those conversations, and this is why we're so focused on community and networking at Able. We do better when we're having these conversations with one another. We get to learn from each other, and that's true for our learners as well. And it requires attitudes that value personal and intellectual growth, right? Understanding ourselves. So as leaders, who are you positioned um, in terms of your initiative and how do you as a leader have an important role to play? So, um, you know, being curious and taking an inquiry stance to who I am, uh, knowing uh, ourselves, what are our values and how that informs what it is that we're doing in our initiatives it can be really powerful. And these are just um, some different quotes about reflection that um, you might uh, find interesting. Um, I love the ones, especially from Dewey and Frary, um, where you know this is the whole process of reflection is is a way of of becoming, right? How do we how do we understand ourselves so that we can best position ourselves in the context of change management on our campuses? And then finally, this practice of storytelling. And um, this comes from um, a book that I recently um, co-edited with some of my colleagues where we had um, educators tell their stories of um, their own learning as a way to think about how we might transform education moving forward. And um, this is just a, a quote from the book that, you know, when we, when we tell our stories, we come to better understand ourselves, our communities, and our broader social, historical, and cultural milieu. When educators maintain an inquiry stance, again, be, when they're curious um, about their practice, stories are not just stories, but they're fuel for personal, professional, and organizational trans, uh, transformation. So our portfolio practices are stories in and of themselves. What we can tell about our initiatives, the stories we can tell about our initiatives helps us to really think about how to manage um, change. So when we tell our stories with portfolios, um, we're able to make meaning, to formulate relationships and continuities. And again, I think this is the piece that often is missing from e-portfolio implementations. And I'm encouraging you as you think about the next change, whether that's artificial intelligence in your context, whether that's um, changing student demographics, whether that's changes in leadership or approaches on your campus, that we're keeping in mind this notion that our stories can help us to understand what it means for us to be human and, and to make sense of and attribute value to the events of our lives, in this case, the ePortfolio initiative that we're um, designing. And then finally, this idea of documenting learning, creating the portfolio itself. So we talk about this with our implementation framework <clears throat> and our stakeholders approach. To, um, to designing and implementing ePortfolios, we're really being intentional about what does the ePortfolio look like, feel like, resonate like for different stakeholders within our organizations and how are we capturing that in a way that um, makes sense for our particular institution. Again, you know, we, and, and I'll say we are guilty of this at ABLE too, because we often talk about needing to create a portfolio of the work that we're doing at ABLE. And um, I think it's really easy to get busy 
um, doing the, the work of rolling out these initiatives without actually thinking about the documentation. Um, but I do have a, a really great example um, to show you here. And this comes from IUPUI. I'm not sure if Rachel um, yeah, or Debbie uh, is, uh, or any of the other IUPUI folks are on in, in this particular session, but if you are, I'm just gonna invite you to unmute and, and share. Um, but what I love about this ePortfolio that um, they've created is it's documenting the learning from their initiative over six years. And so what's really powerful about this particular example, I think, is that they've, they've not only just kept track of what happened over the last six years and put it in a very intentional space in the portfolio, but they also have been really transparent about the things that didn't go well, the adjustments that were made, the ways that they're making decisions about moving forward next that I think is really um, exciting. So um, I see some things happening in the chat, but I don't know. Let me just- I'm pull, here. Pull. You are here. Yeah. Hi. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, Rachel. You and Thanks Debbie for are here. sharing well, our, our um, e-portfolio. We thought, why not create an e-portfolio for our team implementing e-portfolios to show the students kind of the importance of reflecting on our journey with e-portfolios as well. Um, it's been really, really um, rewarding to kind of see the journey that we've gone through. So, yeah. Well, I'm, if I don't, if you don't mind, maybe I could put you on the spot and I'd love to, to hear from you in terms of these skills that we need to manage change or crises? I mean, how, did you experience crises at IEPY? Did you, did you leverage those skills? Are there still skills to be developed within your team? Absolutely. Um, so when we first implemented in 2016, it was a complete failure to the point where we were trying to decide whether or not we even wanted to continue on this journey. We're glad we did. We found ABLE. Um, we went to ABLE <laughs> that summer of 17, and then we took a whole year to basically change our whole implementation plan. And we now are in year five of that implementation, focusing not so much on a career-oriented e-portfolio, but a reflective e-portfolio. And it's been really rewarding. Um, talking about change, IUPUI in itself is going to have major change next year as we're splitting between IU and Purdue. Uh, so I'm sure there'll be some change along the way that kind of trickles down even within the e-portfolio. You know, as you'll see in here, I'm going to have to change the IUPUI and all that stuff. But, you know, just helping students with that change as well and, and ourselves. So. Yeah. yeah, thanks for ch and I and I love that you're already thinking about and preparing for that that change, knowing it's going to like you've seen the that, Well, of course, there's been an announcement, but um, I know you saw the signals in advance. Right. And we're thinking ahead to how you were going to manage this within your initiative. Yeah. It, and I think Mark and possibly Lisa are on here as well, if they have anything else to, to add to that. No, you captured it well, and I and I do. I would just I would echo that um, getting an external voice such as those from Abel uh, revolutionized our view of, uh, and also international perspective too, um, revolutionized our understanding of uh, what we should strive to accomplish with an e-portfolio. And we're excited to talk a little bit more and hear other people's journeys as well. Yes, and remind us all. You're present. Are you in the very next session? Yep, I think you are. Yep, next yeah. session. Yeah. So you can you can come and learn more about uh, about this initiative from from the team here. Thanks so much for sharing. Yeah, I just love that you've done this, and I think um, you know it really to me. It, this is your the power of your story and your documentation of the transformation that's happened so far on your campus, right? And I think really emphasizes the point that this is essential work. We, you know, and I, I love what you said there, Rachel, about we thought it was a really good idea to do this so that also our students could see why we were doing what we were doing. And one of the things we always say in this community is if you're gonna ask your learners or others to create portfolios, you better have one for yourself. And so I think this is just such a great model for all of us to kind of pay attention to. Um, and I think it also points to the ways that you've integrated that um, notion of knowledge management into your initiative 
to ensure that there's going to be lasting change, right? You've got it all written down in a space. So yes, the logo might change, you know, but your story is not going to change, right? That's going to stay the same and you'll be able to continue to add to it and reflect on um, how you've made adjustments moving forward um, so that you'll be in a good, a good spot. So I would say that you and your team are great examples of agents of integration. <laughs> so this is um, uh, Rebecca Nowacek's uh, notion that um, agents of integration are individuals who are actively working to perceive the connections they make and convey them to effectively to others. And I would say prepared leaders do the same thing, right? So really important to be leveraging these this kind of thinking in our e-portfolio work. And I will say, as someone who was doing this, you know, a long, you know, started quite a long time ago, I was not doing this. You know, I think it's it's something that we learn as we we move through our initiatives, and the more we can kind of begin with these ideas in mind, I think the better off the, the better the better we can design initiatives that will be successful on our campuses and help others to to be successful in their work. So, um, you know, so this old idea of um, leveraging these four practices in service of transformational change, I think is, uh, for me, has been sort of an important realization and something that I'm taking into all of the other projects that I'm working on. It's, you know, yes, this is uh, specific to e-portfolios, but um, it's also an opportunity for us to think about how we can leverage these practices in service of other change management um, projects that we might be engaged in. So bringing mindfulness and awareness to um, the present moment, you know, as we're starting initiatives or maybe they're, they're balls that we've been thrown and we've got to pick up and run with, um, really taking some time to figure out what's the landscape look like? What's happening right now? How can I focus my attention on this project in a way that will help us to make meaning of it moving forward? You're engaging in that reflective practice where uh, we're deepening our understanding and making connections between and among um, things that are happening on our campus. So most of us have, maybe we have our e-portfolio initiative, but there are other initiatives underway on our campus and where are there opportunities to, to make connections and um, build bridges between and among those things so that it feels like a coherent whole. I think one of the, the complaints I've heard from students is they feel sometimes like, um, in the case of portfolios, it's very compartmentalized. If you think about artificial intelligence and, and where students might experience different approaches to AI in the classroom, that also is going to be compartmentalizing. And I can imagine that um, will be confusing for students to understand when and when not they might be able to use some of those tools. So having those conversations on your campus, maybe in the context of your portfolio initiative could be really powerful. Um, really documenting, creating records of what it is that you're doing as you're moving through um, your project and then telling those stories, you know, making visible the work that's happening. And again, you know, I always encourage the teams that I work with to really be intentional about that storytelling piece. What's the story you want to tell? If you think again about the arc of possibilities, what's the ending part? You know, what do you want that residual effect to be? And how do you tell the story, construct the narrative so that um, everybody on campus is understanding what's happening in a particular moment. So I want to give you a little bit of time to do a final reflection to and an opportunity for you to begin to do some planning for change that, as we know, is going to be inevitable on our campuses at some point or other. Um, so I'm going to encourage you to just take a moment to think about the nine skills um, for crisis management that you share, I shared and the, the four portfolio practices. Um, how are you planning for change? Um, you can use the Jamboard to reflect one last time, and I'll give you about five minutes to do that, and then we'll we'll open it up for discussion. There's some great um, ideas for planning here in the Jamboard. I'll just read a few of them for again for the recording, but also for all of you. Uh, sense making. Mapping strategic plan to student learning outcomes and retention and success initiatives, leveraging e-portfolios. Yes, love that. Um, you know, I think we we sometimes forget about the retention, and then I almost um, am calling it sort of connection after the fact. So, recruiting students into the in, into our uh, campus, um, e-portfolios can be helpful with that. 
retaining students. So how are we continuing to engage them? And then how are we continuing that connection? So as they move out of our campuses and become alumni, what are the opportunities for them to continue to make sense of their experience in our institutions and how they might want to contribute um, beyond that? There's some great work happening on campuses where they're leveraging alumni in service of um, feedback on student portfolios and things like that, which I think is really um, exciting. Um, Another one here says, go beyond linear thinking. Budgets and personnel change at a small institution require several units to be involved in change simultaneously. Integration is key. Absolutely. And I would say, you know, it's it's that fine line between having too many cooks in the kitchen, which can be problematic, but also having the right stakeholders at the table and particularly in small institutions. But I would say um, that's not untrue for large institutions as well. Having the right stakeholders engaged so that you can move your initiative forward is really important, not only just for funding, but also for um, broader buy-in and um, an uptake of the portfolio. So I think that's um, a really, a really smart thing um, to be thinking about. Um, promoting resilience, I'll continue to add more mindfulness activities to my teaching practices. Yeah. And how do we encourage that on the part of all of our colleagues? Um, we live in a really busy world. I mean, I'm just, I'm so struck as a historian um, in the cool, you know, in the post-Cold Cold War era, uh, post-World War II era, sorry, um, there was this whole notion of a return to normal, right? There was, you know, the white picket fence and, you know, domesticity and things really well documented in the literature that the return to normal was um, a total facade. And I think of that in the context of the post-pandemic period as well. I think, I think that notion is fraught. Um, what is normal? Uh, I, I don't think I don't think we can get anywhere. We can't go back to where we were before the pandemic because we've all been changed so deeply by it, um, and in in many cases traumatized by it. Um, you know, and that I would say goes for ourselves, our colleagues, our students um, alike. So, so what does the new normal look like, and do we actually want to get to normal, or do we want to just um, foster context that really enable this kind of meaning making and um, and and practices that support our own well being. What does that look like? How might your ePortfolio initiative help with that? Um, here's a couple more. We have a framework um, that's designed to allow freedom of individual programs and courses. We're trying to build in change. Nice. So enabling that uh, change thinking into uh, projects so that there's time and space for folks to experience it and to, to learn from it. I think that's a fantastic one. Um, I think we need to begin working with marketing and communications to develop a student-centric portfolio information page or pages. Yeah, communication, um, transparency, making it visible and understandable what it is that you're doing and why to students as key stakeholders and also to others on your campus. So what do deans need to know? What do faculty need to know? What, what do the student affairs folks need to know? Housing, um, career ed, you know, uh, alumni services, you know, how do we make it sense, make sense for everyone? And, and figuring out what that landscape looks like on your campus and who needs to be at the table can be really, really powerful. Um, someone else says, um, answering the question, how does instantiating portfolios advance our adaptive strategic plans priorities? Ooh, I love it. Um, I can't wait to learn more about how you're gonna answer that question and, um, and think about maybe coming to uh, our next ABLE conference and sharing what that looks like on your campus. I'm gonna go ahead and stop share and uh, just give you all an opportunity to um, unmute, ask questions, um, share ideas and thoughts about um, what you've uh, taken away or what, what's resonated for you in today's session or maybe what um, burning questions you still have. Thanks, Tracy. Um, <clears throat> really excited to be here. I'm from Grand Valley State University. Um, I'm, I'm curious, I've heard some folks talk about the distinction between using e-portfolios for reflection and using e-portfolios as career pathway, you know, kind of connections. Um, I would be curious how many folks are thinking to do both, because that's what we're looking at at Grand Valley is sort of bridging that space between 
what's happening in the curricular, the co-curricular and the career services space, thinking about sort of this triple Venn diagram of intersectionality um, and how folks have either been successful or found some barriers to that. It's a great, uh, a great question. I, of course, have a thought, but I'm going to let anyone else who wants to weigh in to please unmute and go ahead. Um, just commenting that the W in kind of a lot of our initial uh, surveying of faculty, that's one of the big sort of connections that we're having the most trouble with is between those two things, because it's it kind of it always ends up being a conversation about one or the other. One of the things that um, uh, I saw recently from the AACNU uh, was a panel on talking about certificates and certification. So things that kind of exist outside of the standard um, like trajectories in education with licensure or in general kind of just resume building, but the idea that building a sort of meaningful certification that is that is supposed to be a representation of that you know that interdisciplinary in an interdisciplinary experience that that student has had um that's still very much just kind of an idea right now but that's one of the things that got me excited about kind of the connection between uh kind of making a list of skills and things that you have, but also being able to say, well, here's how all of those skills apply to my entire life. Yeah, thanks for sharing. Mark. Yeah, to that question, Chris, I think in our journey, I would certainly default to my colleagues, Rachel, Lisa, and Steve. One of the ways that we looked at it is it's not really a dual goal. Uh, it, it, one's gonna come along for the ride. Uh, especially at the first year experience, the context really isn't there to use that as a, a product or a um, artifact for a job. But if you get them thinking about themselves as a reflective practitioner and you offer them various experiences where they can translate things to give meaning to it, I think that ultimate uh, use as a career artifact will, will come along for the ride. So I don't, I, I think I would ask people to really ponder the idea. It's not a one or the other or dual thing. Meet students where they're at. So if you're standing it up for students in the 400 level, you probably should think about a little bit more career, uh, career ready. But if you do what we've done and really with the leadership of, uh, uh, of Rachel uh, and what we've done as a department is really started at the beginning and, and, and it eventually with enough experiences morph into what you're thinking about. So I wouldn't think they're really dual concerns or opposing. It's just a natural evolution, um, at least from what we've experienced in the context on how we've delivered it. Yeah, thanks, Mark. Kevin? I'm building on the great responses to Chris's question. I like to think of it as giving students uh, the you are here in the shopping mall map. And so the ePortfolio experience is broad and, and deep. And so the idea that in my class, which is a general education class, they can show that they've met the learning outcomes from my class is one thing, but I also tell them the reason I require an e-portfolio is so that they own their work. It's not trapped in a learning management system and all these other things. And I encourage them to think about ways that they can use that e-portfolio in different ways. By writing a different reflection for a specific artifact, they can address a different audience. You may remember in Tracy's slides earlier, she had that picture of the stakeholders that was this giant octopus with lots of different uh, people that might be interested in seeing the portfolio ranging from an academic audience with the instructor and fellow students to a professional audience where it might be um, prospective employers or um, career services staff who want to help you find your way. And then there's a personal audience where first generation students may have this as their only opportunity to explain to people why they're doing what they're doing, how they're doing what they're doing, and how they're growing as an individual in, in this experience. So helping students see e-portfolios in a bigger sense, and then just kind of stepping up to that you are here on the shopping mall map and then back down into, okay, now let's get to business and complete this specific task is one way to address that and maybe not see it as separate uh, strategies, but just all part of one bigger whole. 
Yeah, I, I totally agree with what everyone has said. And I think, um, you know, many of us would argue that it's not a portfolio without that aspect of folio thinking built in. So, which is the whole idea of making connections and reflecting on, on your learning in a way that is contextually appropriate for who, you, who you're designing for, right? So um, really just, just thinking about what are those opportunities and reflection in and of itself is an ability that takes time and practice to learn to do well. So the ways that your first year students are thinking about their experience is gonna be different than um, the way your fourth years are, which you know for sure by fourth year, they're probably thinking ahead to career, grad school, whatever the next step is. And in, in first year, maybe they're thinking that a little bit, but they're they're not, you know, not as far along down that journey, um, that down the mall uh, hallway, as Kevin has, has pointed out, as they might be early on. So I think I would I would advocate building some kind of reflective practice into any portfolio will help the students to start to begin to integrate their thinking across their their different learning experiences, which I think can be really powerful. Well, thanks for the question. Other questions or comments? Yeah, I guess I do think uh, reflection can be with a small R or a big R and that the small reflections I think are really important. Even asking students to say, why does this artifact demonstrate this is a form of reflection, a little form, but those are the kind of practices that they're going to need to take forward. Um, in any work that they do of understanding what it is that they're doing and why they're doing it. Absolutely. And Candace, is that you, the, the notion of a durable skill? It's a durable skill for them to, to take with them? Yes, it is. <laughs> I love that language. <laughs> I, I, um, I, I've started to move away, well, a long time ago, I moved away from the whole idea of soft skills because um, soft skills are not soft. They're very hard to, 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 to learn and, uh, and, and have used the word professional skills instead. But I, I love that idea of durability and the fact that it stays with them, right? And um, you might want to look, if you haven't heard about the concept of dur durable skills, actually, I, I put a link there. Um, and there, that's a lot of the work that I'm doing at my institution now is uh, with general education is helping people see that they're learning durable skills in their general education classes and being finding a way to help them make sense of that, yeah, right? That's, and that's and amazing. understand that it, it goes to um, career development. I love that. I think all, all students are, um, you know, sort of focused on that in one way or another, right from the, the, I mean, before they even get to us, I think they're thinking ahead, but encouraged to think ahead to what's their next career. And, and something that I've, I've noted of late is also students, and this maybe goes back to some of the comments that came in um, into our earlier reflections around the change in students is that there's some for some students, also some uh, skepticism about whether or not coming to higher education is actually going to help them get a, you know, get a job, have a career, because they, they, they're bombarded with so much information that tells them that, you know, you'll never own a house and you'll never get, you know, pay for everything. So, so, so everything's so expensive. And it's just, it seems like anything we can do to buttress some of um, those messages can be real and, and to get them feeling like things are possible um, rather than impossible um, today, I think would be really excellent. Kevin? Yes, well, we have reached the 1025 mark in the Pacific time zone and 125 on the East Coast. So I want to help our next speakers uh, get ready. But thank you so much, Tracy, for such a interactive and, and, and thoughtful and inspirational talk and I think it's really set the tone for the rest of the conference. I have in the chat um, a set of slides on how to stay connected to ABLE. I hope that you'll all um, take advantage of that and then um, we just have a short break before we return to um, what Tracy already mentioned. It will be um, the folks from IUPUI elevating and promoting student voice and choice in ePortfolios in just a couple minutes. So stay tuned. Thanks everyone for coming. I hope you have a great rest of the conference. Bye for now.